Well, hello and welcome to that beautiful hour where you sit back and relax and we'll bring you the issues and get really good guests to come and discuss it in depth. And you see, every nation, every individual, every animal has a potential that you know, God gave them. And if we look at the nation, all nations have something that's unique to them. Some are very good at chemicals, others are you know, very good at making plastics. But I guess we, our gift is in our land. And ours is green. And for this nation to have a comparative advantage to any nation in this world, we need to go back to the land and start planting something. And luckily, whatever it is that you plant here seems to do well. So ours is agriculture, and it's undeniable that for Ghana to move forward, we need to take agriculture very, very serious. And there's been a lot, a lot of lip service done to agriculture rather than the practicalities. We go back to when Greek was really full-blown, was what well, days of a IK a champion general, you know, head of state who championed Operation Feed Yourself. And everybody planted something. Even if you just had a balcony, you put some tomato seeds in it, and Ghana was actually exporting food. Right after that, it's been downhill and downhill, and we haven't actually got an agriculture industry to boast of. The new government, Ronaldo's government, is promising a revolution in the agriculture sector. And so they're saying planting food for jobs. And I'm going to discuss this evening to find out if the need is practical, can it be modernized or is it just going to be the same hoe and cutlass but just get us all in the farms digging and hoeing some acre of land or we're going to have that good practical farms, you know, acres and acres of farm producing fine quality beans or seeds that are world class. It's important because that's apart from education, that's our next line of survival. My name is Nana Sakwad for Nakwamu Eduma Sahini and also your host. When I come back, I will introduce my guest. This campaign order will be anchored on the pillars that will transform agriculture. The provision of, in, of improved seeds, the supply of fertilizers, the provision of dedicated extension services, a marketing strategy, and the use of e-agriculture. To initiate the campaign, the district assemblies will be tasked to identify and register progressive farmers in each of the 216 districts. For too long, our farmers have been left to cope by themselves without the necessary support from government. For too long, our farmers have been left to the mercy of the vagaries of the weather. We have decided to embark on a program to provide water to enable all year farming. We're calling it the One Village, One Dam policy. <laughs> Food processing has been the first steps towards industrialization in virtually every country, and it is time for us to take it seriously. Not only will it serve to cut down on the wasted of crops during the high season, it will provide more jobs and expand farming business. We are looking at creation of jobs, creation of jobs globally, agriculture is not the way to look. If you're looking at creation of joy, you'll be talking much more about manufacturing, about industry. Agriculture, by its very nature, as it becomes more efficient, you tend to shed a lot of manpower and move much more into capitalization. You move much more into capital-intensive agriculture all over the world. Go to South Africa, go to India, go to America, everywhere you go. So you're looking at real transformation in terms of job. Agri exactly is not the way to go. But I can understand agriculture in terms of value addition. That actually will bring many more people on, on the... A lot of our young people are not interested in the kind of very labor-intensive agriculture. No, they are interested, in, for example, in agriculture where you don't really employ too many people. For example, you have uh, what you call a like greenhouses. That really doesn't employ a lot of people, but much more effective. The planting for food and jobs 
is a pilot scheme involving 200,000 farmers this coming two months when the program starts. It's going to cost 560 million Ghana cities. You already have 125 million yeah. from no, the Canadian no, government. No. The Canadian facility is for five years. Okay. I'm talking about just this year. Okay, I see. It's going to cost 100 and, uh, f about 125 million US dollars, 560 million. It's going to generate income for these farmers of 1.3 billion and creating 750,000 jobs. So it doesn't necessarily mean that because it's agriculture and it's, it's not growing that you share jobs. It creates jobs. There's an opportunity to create on-farm jobs. Thank you very much for staying. You had those sound bites. Uh, from the president, from Fifi Kweche, from uh, the uh, agri minister too. Uh, with me in the studio, sat right next to me, is uh, Philip Abayori, who is the president of Ghana's Agriculture Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Philip, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And then I have uh, Edward Carriwell, who's the general secretary of GAO. Edward, you're welcome. Thank you, Nana. Uh, let, me, let me start with you with preliminary comments on the seeming agricultural revolution that, that's coming. I mean, this agricultural revolution, I mean, this 560 million uh, is going to be costing. By next year, there are 200,000 uh, farmers already registered. Uh, I mean, air of confidence, air of caution. Well, let me say good evening to your viewers and then uh, also thank you for the opportunity mm. for me to be on this, your esteemed program. I also want to use this opportunity to thank uh, the many Ghanaian workers, particularly the general cultural workers who are all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about a revolution, a revolution is a, a non-common occurrence. It doesn't follow the normal pattern. Otherwise, it's no more called a revolution. You know? And uh, many are skeptical about revolutions. Uh, you don't know the form they take because they defy normality. So this is a revolution. And uh, you should expect that people will be skeptical because uh, there are some people who will think that it cannot happen. But revolutions are only measured when they actually then happen. Then you now everybody becomes satisfied that they have happened. So uh, it, it will not be abnormal to uh, uh, hear people think that they are, they are skeptical, they think that it cannot happen because it's, an, it's not a normal occurrence. More importantly, when you are speaking to people who have, over the years, experienced a certain uh, failure of uh, uh, implementation of promises, then uh, why would they believe this time? But you also, so you have some who will not believe it. but as you indicated, if this is a revolution, it will only be measured after it has occurred. And by then, uh, everybody will believe it. But as it stands now, there, there are some who will be skeptical about its occurring. Philip, the same to you. Uh, you know, the, the new administration is saying that they're going to put a lot into agriculture, and they've come up with their projections and their plans. Uh, from your side, you know, uh, air of caution or air of confidence? Well, I would say it's the air of confidence um, for having the will to do. Um, I was listening to the State of Nation address yesterday, and I heard the president mention agriculture more than 30, 20 times. We keep on emphasizing on agriculture. We need such a commitment from the highest leader of the country. Um, as you know, Ghana is an agricultural country. We are endowed with water, land, and manpower. So then, why should we be importing so much food into the country? Why? shouldn't we even be able to add value for the little we are producing? 
it all boils in commitment from government to show the leadership, put the infrastructure in place for public good, collaborate with the private sector actors to ensure that there is an enabling environment where support is needed, is given, and then we should be able to do targeting to ensure that we upscale productivity. One, my colleague mentioned some few concerns which should be taken into consideration. You need to have direction. And the minister has stated clearly that 200,000 farmers are going to benefit from the program. So we're not talking about 2 million farmers where you have resources which are so meager, you spread yourself so thin, and at the end of the day, you don't have anything to show. So there's a need for a kind of direction. And then the next thing is to look at what crops are fast driven. So you're going to look at some particular side of agriculture. Are you targeting um, crops that at least within three months or six months so you can produce them twice a year? Are those crops going to be really, I mean, targeted for industrial purposes? So these are all things that need to be put in place because it is very possible to be able to revolutionize agriculture. We have done it before. But times have changed. And we need to look at things in a more practical way. The infrastructure that used to exist when we did that program, like the operation feed or cell, do not exist again. Mm -hmm. And this program needs to rally on private sector to be able to achieve its aim. Now, there are areas that need to be looked at. Seed is one of the issues that we have currently that there are short supply of seeds to farmers. Farmers, only 11% of farmers use improved seeds in our country. And you cannot have agricultural transformation without having a backbone of a seed industry that can deliver good seeds to the farmers. And I think that is mentioned, so it's very good. Mm -hmm. The next thing is availability of appropriate technology to create efficiency in the productive production center. So it may not be business as usual, but people must, these 200,000 farmers must be farmers that will adapt some technology that will make them efficient so that they can be competitive and they can make profit because they may need to produce massively to support an industry. Mm -hmm. I can say that we have done it before, and it is possible that we can do it. But it needs to be done in a manner that the private sector is involved. If it is a 100% public-led program, I can assure you that we cannot succeed. Let, let me the bring, oh, sorry. public sector do not make profit. Mm -hmm. They are supposed to carry out programs for public good. Interventions that are made are going to be made based on that notion. And I'm happy to hear that the minister says that the turnover will be 1.3 billion Ghana cities or dollars. That means that they have taken into consideration that, look, government is going to put in this. They expect that injecting that support of the private sector participation, this will be an outcome. And I think that is what we need to be doing. We need to be able to prove that we are reducing the imports for government injecting capital into or whatever supporting, there should be dividends. And if we look at agriculture in this way, I think that in the near future, we can really turn over to ensure that we are producing much for our country. The jobs will be created because the value chain is there. If you're producing maize, you will definitely need agricultural mechanization. You will need input dealers to deliver inputs. You will need aggregators to go back and buy these products. You will need transporters to transport. You will need industry to process. Poultry will need this for feed. Human consumption comes in. So you look at the chain. These jobs can be created. But the will and then also the commitment to do it should be a revolution, as it is, as mm -hmm. you have mentioned. And a revolution, the form of a revolution is sometimes radical. You need to be able to take approach that people, when you need a seeds to be there, they must be there. And somebody must be responsible to ensure because the season is not going to wait for you to come and give seeds to farmer the time you want 
or deliver inputs the time you want, or do plowing mechanization the time you want, come back and pick up the produce or harvest them. It is worked by time. And that consciousness must be there that we have the people who are going to supervise this program must be committed to what they are going to do. Because government have the will to support, but we need people to work. But we should ensure that dedicated and committed people are doing this program. So that at the end of the day, we will realize the results as rapid as we expected them. Uh, I, I, the, the, uh, <coughs> they are starting with maize, uh, rice, soya, sorghum, and vegetables. That's the first year. Yeah. So I think the pilot scheme, this is what they are going with. Are there any strategic reasons why these will be the ones they would choose? Well, I would uh, like to read into their minds, mm -hmm. and then um, you can see that the policy is uh, planting for food and jobs, you know. So what is food? It's not a cash crop uh, type of thing they are targeting here, you know. And then the premise of this policy is that uh, this country is importing so much to feed itself when it can produce enough to feed itself. Now. So coming from that premise and coming from that preamble, you now understand why the policy is about what? Planting for food and jobs. So if you are planting for food, you'll be looking at crops that have a short gestation period. And if you look at maize, you look at sorghum, you look at rice, they are within three months and so on. So within three months, after you have rolled on the program, you will be getting your harvest, you know, and that will immediately you know, uh, deal with the uh, food shortage uh, or the food availability in, in your country. So the food situation will be dealt with uh, in the shortest possible time. And uh, it's also because, because they are also thinking about processing. I think it is, there's an anticipation that the, the food may come at a time that you cannot immediately consume everything. Mm -hmm. So you need to put in place the processing, uh, processing mechanism so that it can st start at the point of harvest. Y you know, so you can see the two are moving concurrently, or they have targeted the, the two at the same time. I can also see that you know, this whole uh, project itself is linked to the one district one factory thing because you know but not in the immediate that is three months one year mm -hmm. but if you look at the uh, the whole four years uh, the two programs will now unite will uh, uh, synchronize that the uh, planting for food and jobs will provide the raw materials for the one factory I mean, one district, one factory, mm -hmm. which would be taken off uh, much more later, because given the the, the 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 longer period that you need to spend in setting up uh, factories, it's not as short as uh, uh, going into farming. So one will now have to look at the overall and read into their mind and look at the linkages. Now. One thing probably we would also need to be looking at is market. You know, if you look at the policy and the way it has been outlined, it's dealing with the supply side for now. You know, and the assumption again is that we don't produce enough to feed ourselves. You know, so there's the market. But here is a market that in actual fact, in real terms, may not exist the way you think it is. Why is this so? Because the vacuum that has been created in the past by the shortfall in domestic production, that uh, vacuum has been you know, uh, taken over by imports. So you need to constrain imp uh, imports in order to create the space for your supply that you are, mm -hmm. you are having. So there's likely to be this challenge. But we can minimize the challenge because in all these programs, one should not expect that it will be implemented 100%. There will not be challenges. It is only proper that you uh, anticipate the challenges, uh, be able to gauge them well, 
and be able to minimize them. You know, so I can would like to see maybe after this place how government is going to address the market because even when it is processed it's not yet uh, consumed you know the consumption you think we've developed a taste for foreign uh, foreign goods it's not because we have developed a taste for foreign goods you know it's competition mm -hmm. Uh, they are producing now to come to meet what is already in the market. If you move out now, you find rice everywhere. Mm. That rice has already been imported. So if you increase your production now, you will be adding to what is already in the market. You, you know, and because that one is of a cheaper value, price probably, it may become more. It will be more competitive still. So you have to gradually phase out or constrain uh, the imports to free the market for the local production. So and that is that this is going to be the challenge. And government needs to monitor it and then uh, do the uh, uh, metrics to ensure that we don't overproduce. Philip, I mean, let, let me bring you in. I mean, yeah. probably that's why the power is sweet. You can just legislate that. Listen. Hospitals and schools and government facilities, you know, you, you dare not eat any rice, you know, made in China. All your rice should be from Aveime <laughs> or, or somewhere local. I mean, I mean, no. Can that help? No. You see, let me um, be very clear on agricultural trade. Mm -hmm. You see, if we produce so much, the market is within us. Let's look at rice. Rice is part of it. And when we produce rice, ideally, when you produce rice immediately, you don't consume it. So that rice must be bought, kept for three months for the dormancy period because you need to be able to keep the rice to kill. And then the rice is processed. A lot of the rice you are eating in this country, some are three, four, five years you go to where they produce the rice, they leave the old stock and the, the new stock is in there. So like he has said, there should be a marketing backup. And I remember, I mean, a month ago or two weeks ago, the minister emphasized that they had some $50 million backup for, I mean, such a program. Okay. So I know that definitely this program is not without planning. So definitely the marketing aspect of it is one, 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 one issue. Now. There is a lot of demand for maize, even locally. Sometimes we need to even import to augment poultry consumption, even year by year, you yeah. know it. Yeah. So that if you are able to produce enough maize, the poultry industry immediately is ready. Mm. And that will mean that we can expand poultry. If the maize is too much for us and we believe we cannot, we will push it to the poultry industry. That means our poultry sector will grow. Okay. So that opportunity is there. Now, with soya bean, poultry needs protein. So animal, the, um, the animal husbandry um, um, uh, sector needs protein. So definitely we're talking about soya cake. So strategically, there is a market already being created within, created within the agricultural sector. When we look at edible oil, we are importing almost 90%. You know what it is. Mm. So now soya bean oil, the oil is there. So it is going to reduce some of the imports immediately that we are mm. And targeting, you look at the gestation period for these products, you can produce maize twice a year. And what it is is that I will say that the post-harvest systems must be enhanced to make sure that in any case we can hold these products for a more longer period. Mm -hmm. Because if currently our post-harvest losses is 40% national average, that when our farmers produce, they lose 40%. If we trigger more production without enhancing the post-harvest part of it, Whilst you are planted a maize and you are harvesting, you don't have a dryer to dry. With, I mean, with, with best practices, Rice, what, what, what are, what's, what's an acceptable post-harvest losses? I don't know if there's any such thing. With it, should, it should be best minimum practices. not less than 5 to 10, 5, maximum 5 to 10 percent. Yeah. You know, but if seven. we are 40, it's too much. And what I'm trying to say is that we need to make sure that that is looked up. We need to ensure that while the farmers are producing, the marketing systems are in place, 
pick up, I mean, so that at least the, the item, but the farmers should not be the same people moving their products because government has supported, there is a glut, they meet at the same marketplace, and then it will become an issue. So I know that this has to be taken care of. We know industries will take time to come, but we should be strategically planning that we ensure that at least in the long term, longer term, medium to longer term, all the raw material that is going to be produced will go to industry. But I am confident that the commitment to support agriculture will transform this country. You have no jobs anywhere to create than having more raw material in the agricultural sector to be able to push industry. And if you have people producing, if you are talking about that, we need to mechanize to reduce the number of people who are into agriculture. Yes? When we are reducing them, technically, the others will find themselves in the value chain. Now, I'll tell you that totally Ghana, we have not been able to prop up our animal husbandry sector because we are burning our fodder. Mm -hmm. So almost all the two, three million tons of maize or whatever we grow or rice, what is happening is that we burn the straw. Let's assume that we want to really do serious agriculture with this intervention and we decide that we'll build this straw. You are creating a secondary employment for people who will build straw. Phil, let me come in here. And I, I, Phil, me, so, sorry mm -hmm. to interject, but I, I realize that, quote unquote, you know, goats and sheep on this side of the world eat the fresh green leaves, but abroad they eat the dry leaves. That is what I'm telling you, that that is another industry, bailing the straw alone and making sure that animal husbandry is... Uh, look at the tongue. No, but they're not going to eat look, it. They want, they want the fresh green no, leaves. No, they will eat it because you need to process it. There is a process that you do and they will eat it and it's more healthier. So in this case, can you imagine that in all this support, these 200,000 farmers, we are bailing their straw. You know how much that will be? You know how many livestock we can grow? And you know, this is a new area. So people will start to, to rear live, livestock. Then you are looking at even having the, 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 the effect of getting back manure from this large production, which will reduce imports of fertilizer. The effects are very tremendous. And we need to ensure that this program is put in place and definitely make sure that it is monitored to ensure that at least it yields its dividend. The employment can be created because it's just one side of it, bailing straw. We have never bailed straw seriously. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a job for somebody. You know, the number mm -hmm. of people. And now people will go into the livestock industry to, pro I mean, to, to increase productivity. We will start to, I mean, go back to, I mean, being able to can corn beef like we used to do. How many jobs are going to, a lot of jobs will be created. So if somebody says agriculture cannot create a job, we should move. Where are you going to move to? We're talking about the service sector today. If we say the service sector is growing, it's growing because the mobile telephony is, people are selling mobile cards, um, people are vending uh, pure water. Those ones are not jobs. And, I mean, those are not jobs. And that is not a service sector we want to, to talk about. We want to see people producing straw and supplying to the livestock sector, seeing the livestock sector, somebody picking the manure and then ensuring that he's transforming it to give back to the farmers. We want to ensure that at least that we are processing oil seed and the poultry uh, uh, people are picking the, oil, the cake and then the edible oil is being processed and transported to the market and then it's being retailed. That is what we're talking about, creating the jobs within the sector. And that is, you, you think that is not going to be a significant uh, uh, job creator to take 60% of the people who are currently in agriculture to move to that service sector? You can transform it by moving about 40% of them in 10 years. You get the point. Mm -hmm. If really you, you, the, all the, the necessary bridges are built. So he is uh, working with the Union of Agriculture Workers, and he knows agriculture can easily transform any country. Let's go to an example of Brazil. And I have to do this example because from 1985, Brazil used to be highly indebted to the, to the I mean, to, to today, what is Brazil? Brazil produced more than two. Uh, 200 million or two bill, uh, mil, uh, 200 million tons of soya bean and export to China. It was only soya bean that transformed Brazil's uh, economy because the Chinese need soya bean and they were ready to pay. They had iron, they had every, they, they have copper, and still they couldn't they couldn't transform. I mean I mean I mean their economy. But when they used this uh, particular product, which has a high, they were able to. You, you, you get the point. So if you tell me that agriculture cannot create jobs, agriculture cannot transform an economy, which one can transform an economy whilst we have got oil in Ghana and we thought that the oil would have saved us? Today, have we been able to get the necessary money that we need to be able to, we borrow more than what we, we earn. But I believe that if we go into agriculture, 
invest more in agriculture. And I will advise the government of the day, put money in the agricultural sector, ensure that you do the right thing, and you will see the dividends. Let me bring Edward in here. Uh, you see the dividends. On, 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 a, on a comment that uh, Philip made, that the if, if, if the government leads it, it will fail. Uh, <coughs> You, you, you are on the ground. You say when the government does what? Leads this, pro this project, yeah. it, it's, it's more likely to fail. Yeah. Uh, you on the ground. Considering how large scale it is, and I'm looking at a you know, cocoa board style of you know, uh, organizing uh, you know, this sector of agri, shouldn't the government lead it? Well, um, I mean, at, to, to which point do you think they should, they should leave? You know, we've had an experience which we, we should rely on. There have been some projects in the past, programs, similar programs like this, which have gone into the drain because people uh, saw them as government programs. And then uh, the government tried to you do that alone. And uh, we, we need to also be frank that uh, uh, we have a certain conception that anything that is coming from government is free. You know, even when you don't uh, uh, pay back or you don't pay attention to it, government will not do anything to you. Sometimes when the government institutions are trying to uh, pursue these people, you know, the communities rise up against them, you know. <laughs> uh, excuse me, there are chiefs somewhere who say, look, you can't harass my people because of this and so on. You know, so we need to actually move away from that. And then government could provide the resources. Government has a role to play. But then government should not be the sole uh, 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 partner in this particular uh, project. Because it, it will even be too much for government to monitor, you know, the, 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 the progress of everything. You know, and that is where the private sector has a role to play. And you need to know what role should the uh, private sector play so that the whole project could become more efficient and then uh, deliver on its objectives. So you, you look at program by program. You know, the generalization of solutions is the thing that is also killing it. You know, you think that when you conceptualize that the private sector must play this role, Yes, in a particular program, that rule, if they play it, is good. But in another one, no. We need to be surgical in uh, prescribing the rules that uh, partners play and at what level do they play. You know, so otherwise, um, we may pump in money and then at the end of the day, we will not get the results that we wanted. And there have been some uh, examples here. For instance, the, 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 if you take the uh, subsidized fertilizer, you know, this is a loud approval program where it is supposed to have supported farmers to produce. But it does not get to them. Because if government has to do it alone, what then happens? You know, and if you don't allow the private sector to intervene at the right, you know, stage of implementation, then you, you, you lose the effectiveness of it. And we are too old enough. We are too experienced enough to repeat those uh, mistakes. Uh, 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 mistakes, you know, and that's why we think that it can be done. You, you know, it can be done. And again, let's look at that great uh, ability to generate jobs vis-a-vis -vis other sectors. Mm -hmm. Is that if you take the services sector, the type of jobs that it has produced are within the towns and the cities. Mm -hmm. A great would have kept these people Over there. at. Uh, in, in the hinterland, you know, so you uh, uh, free the cities and the towns from the congestions that we have. Mm. It's not only about the fact that uh, these people are on the streets, they sell some of these uh, services which do not give them enough money. It's not only about the uh, uh, indecent work environment that they find themselves, but at the end of the day, they must be accommodated. So they cannot even afford to pay for the rent within the city and the town. So they sleep on the street. They litter uh, uh, the street. And you have a huge problem that you cannot deal with. 
But if these people were kept at bay, at where uh, close to their own environment in the rural areas, you see, the problem of accommodation, even if it's there, it will be minimal. You see, mm. and the pressure on social amenities will also be minimal. And this is how you should create the jobs. Again, theoretically, when your economy matures, a Greek will free its labor force to industry. But we have not yet gotten to that point. We haven't yet gotten to that point. So it will get to a point where when you invest more, uh, the per capita labor uh, job creation will begin to reduce. You, you see, but we haven't yet gotten there. We haven't yet gotten there. So as it stands now, given our labor force, the skills that are there, the, the, the class of the demography, the class, class of people who actually want the jobs, the JSS, the SS, the, the, you know, it's agricultural jobs that could fit them well. You see, so it is not to just say that the theory says, oh, agriculture uh, should free its labor force to uh, industry. Yes, you talk about the U.S. These are highly advanced economies. You talk about the Europeans, highly advanced economies. So if you spend a dollar or one city of uh, 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 in agriculture here the number of jobs it will create will be more than if you spend the same thing in europe mm -hmm. you know just as when you spend uh, uh, ten thousand cities in uh, services the services sector the number of jobs that it will create will be less than when you spend the same ten cities in agriculture but it doesn't mean that the story will be the same we will get to a, a time when when the economy matures, you may not get that return, that return as it is today. The, the other thing is, they, they, they are looking, this program is looking at improved seeds, fertilizer, extension offices, e-agriculture, and marketing. Is that the full chain, or they've missed something out? Uh, you, you see, there is something you said which I wanted to buy into it. Why is Ghana Cocoa Board very successful? Hmm. It was set to do certain things. There was also another institution in the agri sector which was supposed to be doing what Cocoa Board is doing, but it's not doing it. So I think that that is the institution that they should prop up and ensure that it does the job. And that's the Grains and Legumes Development Board. They are not supposed to be working on seed. They are supposed to be working as a board, like Cocoa Board, ensure that all these mechanisms of seed, I mean, uh, crops, I mean, the systems that are supposed to, the, these marketing systems are supposed to be under them. So I would think that the program should work with such an institution. Now, 512 million Ghana cities, good. I will wish in one way and the other, the minister will call the private sector and tell them that we had 520, uh, 500 million yeah, Ghana yes. cities here to put into agriculture. Now, we are going to use this money to do A, B, C, D. Our total money that we five, need... 560. 560. Yeah. The total mm -hmm. amount that we would need to be able to ensure that we have a whole universal system in place is 200 million... Uh, is let's say, two billion. We want you to fill the gap. We want you to fill the gap in investing in these areas because this is an investment that we are putting in so that it becomes a comprehensive program. Mm -hmm. you, you understand? That means that the private sector, it shouldn't be, government alone do not have the resources. If you put in 500 million, it may be so much, but it will not be able to address all the issues because the sector is big. See, but because of <clears throat> vulnerability, uh, nobody wants to invest in agri because you don't know when the droughts are coming. We are depending on rain. You know all these things. So probably that's the, why government is alone. You know what? No. I'm taking the risk. I think I think uh, the perception is wrong. That is why government said one village, one dam. Mm. If the weather, that is that, that is the issue. 
Now, we also have an agricultural insurance. And this agricultural insurance is backed by C3 insurance. It can, re it can insure. But I keep on saying something. We have three categories of farmers in the country, and we should not forget that. You have the smallholder farmers who produce food for mere subsistence. Then you have the medium-scale farmers who produce food and send to the marketplace. Then we have the large-scale farmers who have the capacity of doing everything. We need to target what really we want to do. There have been a conception that, look, let's have an agro-grower system where a medium-scale farmer has these small farmers under him and provide him the necessary, those small farmers with the technology and everything to have scale. So that just producing for mere subsistence will increase them as agro-growers for them to be able to make income. Good idea, brilliant idea. If we are able to do that, what will happen is that the subsistence farmer who cannot turn around will be able to get good seed, he will be able to get mechanization, and then he also has a market because someone is taking for him. We need to develop a system. But at the end of the day, who has, what are we going to do with the products? Industry is ready. Who ensures that those produce get to the industry? Who transport? You know, we, we need to have a consensus of various actors who are going to act in a manner that will create the jobs. I'll tell you that it's the private sector that will create the majority of the jobs. Mm -hmm. But the systems must be put in place, and it must be inclusive. People in the private sector, this program must be a private-led one. And when I say private-led, if government invests 500, you may be surprised the private sector will invest another 500 because the people have to transport this. They are going to invest. They are not going to take the 500 million, but they will come and transport the goods. You get the point. So we need to look at it in that broad manner. And if we make this program very successful, it will expand on its own. And then eventually, we will have enough raw material for industry. We will also be able to guarantee our food security. And I think this is what we need to do. Why we think that it shouldn't be hooked on only public sector is that that's why you see programs running. And when the system when, 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 when at a particular time, when the system changes, everything goes. You, you follow? But mm -hmm. we need sustainability. It's a laudable program, and it should be able to continue. continue. We need to learn from <coughs> our mistakes. We have made some successes, and we have also made some mistakes in trying to work with the private sector. We need not to repeat those mistakes. Mm -hmm. We need to ensure that this time, the public sector role will be played and seen this gap. So that if there is deficiency, if the program has any problem, we will know how to correct it, not to wait. So that at the end of the day, when the program totally fails, now we are blaming people. Once on the implementation, the implementation is going on, we need to be able to have follow-up to ensure that where there are hiccups, we address them. And the private sector is very good at doing that. If they know they are going to benefit and make profit in something that is there and something is going wrong, they will not sleep. And that is why we think that the private sector needs to, there's, there's a need for a collaboration for a <coughs> Edward, one thing that's bedeviled this, this sector is that they said agric is not very sexy. So all the, you know, nice looking young men and women don't want to venture. So if this is going to be an area where we, how, how do we, make a Greek sexy so that we, you know, we don't look down upon it? Well, the, we can envisage what type of, uh, I mean, image we want to create for agriculture. It's the image that makes it sexy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I expect that this program, uh, Revolution, which is about to be launched, mm -hmm. is, should also incorporate in it, you know, uh, rebranding the system of strengthening these institutions. You know, there are public sector institutions that are involved. I expect that by the end of the day, they should be able to strengthen the Ministry of Agriculture, strengthen them in the sense that the way they do things in the past should not be the, the same thing. And this is what, again, was uh, mentioned by the President, that even the other arms of government, you know, must, you know, cannot do things as usual, you know. So public institutions must not uh, remain the same. And 
give me an example of something ministers are doing which you think, look, moving forward, they may, they may have to do it differently. For instance, the extension services uh, unit of the Minister of Agriculture is almost dead. You, you know, where are the extension officers? You, you know, and yet they are the vessel. I must say, mine is very good. Felix, he always comes around. Yes, that is one person. I'm saying this uh, yeah. <laughs> institution, you know. Yeah, there are many of them. You know, they don't have logistics. They are uh, poorly motivated, you know, and the numbers are simply just not there, mm. you know. And statistics shows that uh, we need about 4,000 extension officers now to be recruited, you know, at least 4,000. What we have on the ground now who are not employed are about 3,000 uh, who have come out of the agri uh, colleges. Mm -hmm. You know, so fortunately for government, Is you have a shortfall of uh, uh, at least 4,000, and then you have a labor pool of what, 3,000. So if government taps into that, they can fill in the gap, and then it will be left with 1,000, which can be, you know, uh, uh, filled later on. Mm -hmm. So the program, and we hope that by the end of uh, this program, or p partly, it will. Uh, uh, strengthen Minister of Agriculture, mm -hmm. particularly with the extension services. Now, the Greens uh, and Legumes Board must be revamped. What we I may not like to see is who produces the seed, how is the seed developed, you know. There will be some importation, though, to supplement. But this uh, Greens and Legumes Board must be strengthened, must take this opportunity. You don't want any funny GMO? Oh, certainly this country, we don't have, uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's, a, it's against the law to bring in GMO. So unless we, we have legislation to bring GMO, if anyone does it, it is against the, the rules of this country. So we can't talk about that. <laughs> now, so once this uh, Greens and Legumes Board is strengthened, of course, they will now continue to produce the seed. Because it is expected that the program uh, will multiply and more seed will be needed. So you need to grow the institutions that will produce that with the initial implementation. So we expect that uh, that institution must feature strongly in it. We expect that Minister of Agriculture, particularly the Extension Services uh, uh, Unit, must feature strongly. And that will also mean that Recruiting officer, because according to the Minister for Agriculture himself, that about 80% of the existing uh, extension officers within the next three years will go on retirement. So the next three years, 80% of extension officers will go on retirement. It is a call, it is a, an information at the right time that you have to start recruiting now. And it is not... you. For you to recruit at the time that these 80% have exited, then you have to recruit for them to learn from the old ones before they leave. So that is why it is agent, in my view, to recruit the 3,000 uh, graduates. And you are also solving the unemployment problem that is there. Let, let me come back to uh, Philip, Philip, because of timing quickly, but uh, what can we do to carry the masses along like Operation Feed Yourself, that even though times are different, but we still need to get back to you know our green fingers on. What what can the what should the government do? You see, we need to whip up the interests of the people. And I think when this program was announced, everywhere you go, they say oh, Operation Feed Yourself is going to start. Everybody will have to farm. And where are the lands? I said, look, make yourself available. If you want to do poultry. I hope there will be a way that you could get good poultry uh, birds to, and some technology to start a backyard farm. If you want to do small gardening, I hope you can also start. And if you want to market anything, put yourself, put something, put something, and just start thinking of something. And I think that the young people want to farm. They want to work. They want to lay their hands into whatever they can do. The issue is that they are not prepared for drudgery. So we need to make technologies, appropriate technology available 
Yeah. If a young man wants to do his two, three acres, he doesn't want to go and take atlas and go and go and bend down and the farm. He, he wants to have a kind of mower, and uh, he has his uh, small tablet. He wants to calculate his fuel and make sure that everything is okay. He finishes, and uh, he, he is happy. And then he knows that he works for two, three hours or four hours. I mean, he planned him, his life not to go with a cutlass and hoe and stay in the farm in the evening, uh, sit under the tree and then uh, uh, roast some two yams. You know, that is not what they want. And I think that there are technologies available which can, I mean, we, I mean galvanize the, the, the young people. It's not only production. Some young men came to me and said they wanted to form an NGO. Th 30 seconds, land issue. Yeah. I know there's so much to talk about, but land, land acquisition, you know, 30 seconds. How, how, where do we start from? So well, there's, uh, there, there's a lot of land available. Um, we're talking about just crops, not cash crops. Mm -hmm. And then land are available. If you approach any land owner that you want to farm and you agree with him on terms, there is land available. I don't want to... Uh, land, land issue? I don't think it's a, a big issue for big issue. the purpose of this uh, uh, project. Mm -hmm. Some people may be crying that there's no land because it also depends on what you want the land for. Land for. <laughs> but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to this particular program, there's land. that there's enough land, mm -hmm. and uh, we will now be dealing with uh, the land as we move into the future. Because you will be migrating from this uh, uh, peasantry type of farming yeah. into large-scale yeah. farming, okay. and by then you'll be addressing the land issue. But as it stands now, no even though one may be hearing that there's land lack of land mm -hmm. and problems and the rest. I don't think it's an issue for this project to uh, carry on, to be carried on successfully. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been uh, insightful and uh, definitely, definitely, Ghana should go green and the guys at the top should lead it and we from behind will push it as much as we can. Uh, thank you very much, Philip Abayore and Edward Carraway. And to you at home, uh, the number I always give you before I leave is 024366. 2001 024 uh, Tanti is fashion, they make my shirts for the show. My name is Nana Ansakwa the fourth. Uh, producer is Aisha Ibrahim and the director is Yao Forsyth. Thank you. See you tomorrow.